Welcome to the Mavens of Marketing, a weekly podcast hosted by me, Rachel Durkin. And me, Carrie Barrett. We talk all things marketing, innovation, sales, and business growth strategies, and the standard tried and true marketing techniques. Come for the conversation, stay for the savvy insights. And the borderline inappropriate jokes. Welcome to the next episode of the Mavens of Marketing. I'm your host, Carrie Barrett, along with Rachel Durkin. And today we're going to get right to our introduction. We are super excited about the guest that we have. She is a legend in the world of digital course creation. We've got Amy Porterfield. I, I, I've been, I'm so excited to talk to you again. <laughs> so I'm Amy, so excited. This is going to be I, fun. I'm a fan, but like Carrie's a super fan. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm your raving fan. I'm like, we have to get her. She's amazing. <laughs> I love Every it. Day, she's, she's been really excited for this interview. I got it. <laughs> How are you? I am good. I'm good. I'm trying to stay warm over here. Yeah. I just moved from sunny, beautiful California to very cold Nashville, Tennessee, unseasonably cold right now. So you'll find me literally in a puffer jacket like every day. Like my husband's like, we please take that jacket off. I'm like, I can't. How, how warm is it? Okay. Well, I'm kind of, it's so funny because my Boston coworker said like, how many inches did you get? And I'm like, like three inches. <laughs> and she laughed like you girls are right now. Like you're a joke. I was mortified. But growing up in California, Southern Cal, we don't see this. Mm -hmm. no. Have yeah. you driven in the snow yet? Uh, no, my husband is driving me around like driving Miss Daisy. I, I can't do it. The back seat? No, no, it's sure. not that bad. <laughs> you sit in the front with him. Oh, that's nice of you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes my dog's in the front and I'm in the back. <laughs> Priorities, definitely. Love it. I absolutely love it. Well, it's a hard know. adjustment. And I, I actually find that, and I really enjoy the sunny weather, but I get really hot, like uncomfortably hot because oh. I'm so used to the cold weather. Yeah. Interesting. But yeah, you we'll do definitely get the blues. I have, you know, when I haven't, I, I realize, and COVID makes it worse. I have not been outside for like four or five days straight. Yeah. Like there's, I've just not oh. gone outside. But then I <laughs> will say gets crazy. I have, so my husband is, is for ex Air Force. And so he has friends that are all over the country in different Air Force bases. And we have some friends that are up in Alaska. And when I talk to them about me having uh -huh. seasonal yeah. affective disorder, <laughs> they laugh at me. When I talk about four feet of snow, they laugh at me. That's true. You have to, the grass is always green. I have a client in, uh, gosh, this was a couple of weeks ago in Canada. And I was complaining because we had people from Miami on the phone and then Canada and then us. And I was like, kind of ripping on the Miami people because like their life is perfect. And yes. I was like, it's so hard here. He's like, are you kidding me? It's 28 degrees below Celsius yeah. below. Yeah. And if you walk outside for more than 30 seconds, you will get frostbite. And I'm oh, like, okay, I'm maybe I should stop complaining. <laughs> <laughs> we all think so good. Good. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. So it could always be worse. Let's start thinking of it that way. Yes, but I do point. feel your pain, Amy. It's a big yeah. adjustment from the beautiful weather to colder weather. Know and everything else. Well, we are certainly glad that you've made time in your busy day to talk with us because you, A, you've got a launch going on. There's a ton of stuff that you have going on. And, and, and we have a bunch of questions for you about marketing and your courses and, and sort of how you, you got started in the direction and, and have made it such the huge success that it is. So I guess my first question for you is, when you, when you started on this marketing journey, did you have specific goals in mind and how did you, how did you make them happen? Cause it wasn't all smooth sailing. Oh no, no, no. So I always say that I'm an ex corporate girl turned entrepreneur. And really I should say turned accidental entrepreneur. Never in my life did I think that I'd be growing my own business and being my own boss. What happened was uh, for seven years, I worked with peak performance coach, Tony Robbins, and I got to travel the world and work on his events and courses, like unleash the power within date with destiny. Anybody who knows Tony knows those events. And I learned so much from him about being an entrepreneur. And I started to think, what if I did this on my own? What if I taught marketing and social media and was my own boss? And honestly, what I wanted more than anything, I didn't leave corporate because I wanted to change the world or help thousands of people. I do want to do that now. But back then, 12 years ago, 
All I wanted was to not have a boss. I didn't want to be told what to do, when to do it, or how to do it. And I didn't want to ever hit that glass ceiling that so many of us women have hit and crashed into again and again. So when I went on on, on my own, my goal was just like, just make as much money as I did in corporate, just so I could pay the bills and ha have the life I have right now. But I didn't have these huge dreams of building an empire like I have today. But then when I started to go, I thought, holy cow, there's so much potential here. There's a lot that I could do. So my ultimate goal was to create digital courses and sell them online. 12 years later, that's exactly what I do. I don't coach. I don't consult. I teach through my digital courses. So I always had that dream, but holy cow, it was really hard the first two years. I crashed and burned more times than I want to admit. And I always say the solopreneur, I call it the solopreneur's curse, but you have to kind of pay your dues over the first two or three yes. years. And it is painful. I say to this day, I don't know if I would ever go back to doing it again. I'm glad I did. Right? If someone told you how hard it was, would you really yeah. do this? I don't know. But once you're in it, you know, you're committed and then the outcome is so wonderful. It's kind of like having a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I've been told. I've been told. Yes. <laughs> So and it's, it, it, no. it's also annoying, even when you're successful, kind of like having children. So <laughs> you wouldn't give that for anything. That is also true. I mean, we love them to pieces, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. there are times when I'm like, well, I had a pretty good thing going. Why did I just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> do it? <laughs> so so good. This, when you talk about the ups and the downs and you always had this sort of simple idea, you weren't going to do the coaching, you weren't doing public speaking, books, you have, you have your courses and you have your podcast. We want to introduce people to that as well. But it was not... You know, when you and I spoke previously, you talked about you, you launched this first course and you, you know, you were, you were ready to sit back and sort of let it come in and it was crickets. Yeah, it was, it was really tough. So I launched this first course thinking I had come from, so from the Robbins world where they're, you know, making millions. And then I left and I took some consulting clients and worked on their launches and they were making millions. So I'm like, of course, I'm going to make millions with this first course. Oh, nice. So I get it out into the world. And like you said, crickets. And I remember being so embarrassed and feeling like so shameful, like I am not cut out to be an entrepreneur. And I looked at my husband and I said, I'm going to have to go grovel back for my job. Like, like how embarrassing. I mean, $267 with that first launch. And my big fatal mistake was I didn't grow an audience. I didn't have an email list. Nobody was listening, but I didn't know what the heck I was doing. So it was a lot of doubt for many years, quite honestly, comparing myself to other people, especially other female entrepreneurs that had gone before me and had bigger businesses and a lot of doubt, like you're going to have to go back to your job. You're going to have to go back to your job. I was very fearful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of your greatest strategies though, in coming out of that and building has been your list creation, your, mm -hmm. your email list creation. And I'd love for you to talk to our audience about why that's important, how you go about doing it and some, some sort of tips or tactics, strategies, perhaps that they can put into practice so they can start building their list for, for their product or service. Yeah. So the, the great thing to know, anyone who's listening right now, they're like, oh my gosh, list building. I wouldn't even know where to start. The great thing is you don't need a huge list to be successful. In my world, I teach people how to create digital courses. And I've got success story after success story from my students of a list of a hundred people and they made $10,000 with their first launch or 500 people. And they made six figures with their first launch. So it's, it's not the size of the list. It's really the quality. So keep that in mind. Anybody who's listening thinking you don't have to get to hundreds of thousands for this to actually work. But the, the number one tip I can give for list building is to be intentional and make it part of your business, not just something you do. And then you move on to something else. Like every day in my business, I am growing my list every single day and I'm intentional about it. That doesn't mean that I'm actively doing something to take me away from the other stuff. It means that I've got things in place that are growing my list. So let me give you an example. I always have a lead magnet, uh, some kind of freebie that I can give away. I have multiple, but you always start with one and it's a cheat sheet, a checklist, a guide, something that your audience would say, this is so valuable. I'd pay for it, but they don't have to pay for it because it's free. So they're willing to give up one of their most, um, most valuable assets, their name and email in exchange for your freebie. 
Now, when you've got this freebie, you talk about it everywhere and anywhere. So like what I said, every day I'm list building. If you listen to my podcast, you'll hear me likely on one of my podcast episodes mention a freebie you can sign up for. If you go to my website, you'll see a pop-up box right now with a freebie of a quiz that I have going on right now. So you, everywhere you go, you'll see an opportunity to get into my world with a freebie. That's what I mean about being very intentional about growing your email list. It's working for you all the time, even if you're yes. specifically focused on that. Whenever we're yeah. working with clients, we always talk about kind of two goals that should always be in your mind for every tweet, every Facebook post, every conversation you have. One being direct ROI, obviously, and that's the long game goal. But then the other is bu building brand assets, I call it. So that would be your email list or your social following or whatever it might be. How do you, for, for people who are skeptical, because I find that they're always skeptical until they do it. How do you um, reconcile the, the brand assets over to the direct ROI? Like talk to me about like kind of that, that funnel or that user funnel. And I'm sure you teach a lot of that. Yeah. So when we're talking about like the asset of an email list, it, it might take a little bit a, a while to turn that name and email into a paying customer. So number one, it does take patience. And I think those that are winning in this game, they know they're not looking for that instant gratification, but it doesn't have to take that long. And, and the way you, you justify that is you've got to have something that you offer that people are gonna pay for. And a lot of, uh, I know um, we're not just talking to the ladies right now, but a I work with a lot of women entrepreneurs. And one of the things that often get them stuck is charging for their stuff, mm -hmm. making an offer, putting Even a price tag on it. Even like I, I, I've had people say, oh, I told them to charge like $5.99 for this. I'm like, why? <laughs> yeah. Yes. You're and, not gonna have- you're not going to sell a million of them. So it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Right. So putting together, I often encourage my students, let's put together an offer, whether it be a digital course or a coaching package or whatever, a membership, whatever you want to do, we've got to put something together that people will pay for. Because once you nurture that email list, then you're going to start making offers. You've got to make offers. And the minute you do, you will see the value of that email list. It's funny. I, my dad is a firefighter, blue collar to the bone doesn't understand any of this online marketing thing. So when I quit my corporate job for the first few years, he's like, uh, what's going on? I'm nervous. Are, are you able to put food on the table? Like this is all going to go away. And I said, dad, you don't know what an email list is, but let me explain what it is. And as long as my email list is, is growing, I will always be able to make money. Always. I love so that's that. the only that's thing he heard. And now he'll, he calls me and he'll be like, how's your email list? Like he still doesn't get it but he just wants to know it's growing. And I mean that if you want more confidence in your business, grow your email list. Cause you will, you can always make an offer. And if that email list is engaged and loyal, they will buy. Oh so gosh, it's like, is that a meme? confidence? You need to make that a meme. Yeah. You make that a meme. <laughs> Put it all over the place. That's such good advice. I love that. So you mentioned the lead magnet, right? And Talk to the audience for a second. It's really about as you build these courses, I always, I, in course business planning, I always see this concept of like the way I'm going to generalize it is like freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, you're graduating people to be more in, with greater expertise, you know, as they go. And it starts with a lead funnel or a lead magnet, and then maybe a masterclass webinar, and then maybe a course. Talk to me about... I see so many people who come out and just say, I'm going to do a course and then they're done. Like I'm going to do my uh, first course, but I really believe that you should be planning your business model. Even if you don't have all the courses done the whole way through. So I mean, that's just my opinion. So I'm just curious as to how you approach that. So wait, tell me, I want to really understand. So uh, they're like, I just want to create a course and you're suggesting what? So I always see it. It's okay. Well, let's, let's think of the logical evolution of education and intelligence for your audience, right? So you have like a freshman level course. I mean, oh, for those gotcha. Yeah, you, yes. I'm using air quotes. And, you know, then it goes to a more advanced course and then maybe like a, a training or whatever it might be. But I always find that there's, there's a more impactful long-term revenue stream if you're planning the business model over the course of a year or two years for growth to, to move your audience through a journey. So I'm just curious if that's an approach you take or if that's not... If, if totally Rachel's off. entirely screwed up with her thinking. No, she's absolutely <laughs> not. very plausible. And no. Oh, and here's the deal, Rachel. What you just outlined is so ideal and very strategic. And what I wish uh, we all did. The only challenge is most people when they're first starting out in their business, and I work with more like first or second year in their business, 
they don't know what they don't know. And so a lot of the times I will encourage my student to create what I call is a starter course, which is like a 101 jumping off point. Like my very first course that was successful that I created was how to get started with Facebook marketing, Facebook marketing 101. And so if they create this course, what happens is they start to learn more about their audience. Their audience tells them what they like, what they don't like, what they're struggling with, what they want more of. And what happened for me is I got this course out and people started saying, we love this, but what we really want now is how to do Facebook ads. So that's what I call a spotlight course where you take one area of your expertise and you go really deep with it. So that was like the next evolution. And then from there, my students said, okay, this is great. How do I put this together into a marketing plan. So I started to listen even more. And that's when I moved on to my signature course, which is the big daddy whole shebang front um, start to finish how to make a total transformation in your marketing plan. So I agree with you. I totally love the customer journey. Start with the 101, get a little bit deeper and then go for the big transformation. But typically they can't, most of my students can't map that out in the yeah. first two years, they need to just do one thing and their audience will help them guide them to the next. It's like take the first right step and then yes. follow the path. Got and it. Follow the path. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they they do make a lot of assumptions based on what the audience, what they think their audience mm-hmm. wants without actually digging down and figuring out what they truly would like to know. Yeah, for sure. I one. see it all the time. And so I think... Um, I don't know why this episode becomes about my dad, but another thing that my dad would say when I was in second grade, I was a talker. I always got talking on my report card and he'd drop me off at school every day. And he'd say, Amy, before I left the car, he'd say, it's better to listen than to talk. It's better to listen than to talk. And I brought that into my business because the more I just kind of shut up for a while and listen to what they're telling me, they will guide me into a money-making opportunity. But, uh, you know, uh, lots of entrepreneurs, they actually talk, 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 talk. And it's like, are you listening to what your, your audience is telling you? Right. You know, one of the things you talked about email um, list creation, you also have a huge social following outside of that, right? All anybody has to do is hop on your Instagram and, and see the people who not only follow you, but engage with, with what you're doing there. I have, I have sort of a two-part question about that. Number one, how important was growing your social following in terms of your marketing? And then was, you have a lot of content on there. Was content creation a big part of that focus in terms of driving the engagement? Yeah, I believe that content is everything. And I remember watching the Kardashians, no joke. I was watching an episode of the Kardashians and Kim Kardashian kept saying, I need content. I need to create content. I'm like, what are you talking about? I didn't even understand what that word meant for her. It was more like images, but this idea of content, it really is like the foundation of any business, especially online business. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of creating content, whether it be behind the scenes, or whether it be a picture of my dog, like I'm going to give you three content ideas that have nothing to do with creating courses, but everything to do with engaging on social. So yesterday I posted um, actually a day in my planner. I use a paper planner as well as a digital. So I showed, I opened it up and I literally showed the day, everything that I had planned. And then uh, that was a huge hit with my audience. They just want to see what I'm doing. And then another one would be me out in the snow with Scout in my puffer jacket, complaining yet again about the snow. Yeah. (laughs) And then it's up to my big toe. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. And then from there, we, I, I would do a piece of content again, nothing to do with creating digital courses, which is what I do, but it might be me and Hobie. Funny enough, Hobie's my husband. Funny enough, my mom, I was at her house having dinner the other night and she said, "Um, do you think you post too much about how hunky you think your husband is? It's a little much and annoying. My mother told me this. And I said, mom, what you don't know is the analytics show that my audience likes Hobie. Like, yes, he likes. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Right? I will use my husband however I need to. Exactly. <laughs> I will pimp him out. I will pimp him out. 100%. So I think it, I think social is incredibly important, but here's the thing. I'm not a master at social. I'm not, I don't teach it per se in that respect. I, I weave it into how to grow an audience, but it's not my forte. And I don't do all social well. So I've got Instagram and Facebook. Those are Instagram really is my favorite, but I've got Instagram and Facebook where I spend 
most of my time and now clubhouse. I am yes. a little obsessed with clubhouse. We might need to talk about that. Yes. Um, but I don't do LinkedIn really well. I don't do TikTok. Like, don't freaking make me dance. I don't like that. Uh, <laughs> it's not my favorite thing. So I, I pick and choose what I want to do. Although I will tell you the other day, did you see that one? Like they sometimes have those TikToks where like women can do this and men can't do uh -huh. that. You know, they can't bend over and pick up the chair. Mm -hmm. There's one where you put your feet up against the wall and you get on your hands and knees and women can just sort of lift themselves up. It has something to do with our center of gravity, but if you do it next to your husband, chances are he won't be able to. Oh, I will be doing that. Well, I'm yeah. gonna need a demonstration, <laughs> Carrie. <laughs> no, you know what? My camera angle. And I'm also, and I'm also right, a I want, I want John with the cell phone video. I need to see this. Well, listen, I will. As soon as this call is over, I'll get him on the floor and we'll practice. Please, <laughs> please. I'm gonna change out of my pajama pants. <laughs> You might need that for the bending ability. Don't put anything. 100%. So let me ask you this. I want to ask you another question about the course creation. And, and one of the things that I think a lot of people struggle with is I don't have, I don't know how to do anything. Like what, what the heck could I possibly teach somebody? Yes. And, the, and I think in your words, the key is if you've ever had somebody say, wow, how do you do that? You have a course. True? Potentially, yes. Okay. So what I always say, you're exactly right. I do say that. And I, I always say, okay, look in your life, not just in your career or business life, just look your entire life. Where have you gotten results for yourself or for somebody else? And what, when do people say like, how did you do that? What, what, mm -hmm. what, what, what steps did you take to get there? And typically that is a good sign that you could have a digital course. And so it might be like my good girlfriend, she is in corporate, uh, at a publishing house. She does marketing, all that stuff. But what she's really passionate about is growing Airbnbs. So she, people are always asking her, how do you make so much money with your Airbnbs? And so now she's creating a course, teaching people how to do that. So it doesn't have to be the job you're in right now. A lot of digital course businesses start as side hustles. And so just think about where have you lost weight in a unique way? Did you teach yourself how to run a marathon in a way that nobody else has done before? Um, and, and it doesn't have to be nobody else has done it before, but no, you've never taught it that way. Like you have your unique aspect aspects, uh, personality, characters that you're going to add to it. So I believe everybody has a digital course in them. So let me ask you a question for the people who want to do their first course. What is the, as you mentioned, being an entrepreneur is really hard and scary and terrifying and all the negative emotions, but the reward is wonderful. What, what are the expectations? So, you know, you're going to put a ton of work into creating the course. You're going to put a ton of work into the marketing, the course you know, what is the runway we should mentally prepare for, right? If you want to do that, like what, when do you, don't give up too soon. Don't give up right before the finish line. So just give everybody an idea of like how long to push. That's a great point. Okay. So I think it takes about three to six months to create and launch your first digital course. Definitely. You could do it in three months, but sometimes with people have nine to five jobs and they're doing it at night in the morning, it could take up to six months. So once you get that out into the world, that is just a test, just an experiment. And so you're launching just to get the experience. Now you could literally make some great money on your first launch. I have hundreds of stories about that, but let's just use it as an experiment. The second launch, now you're dialing it in, you're getting better, you're perfecting your marketing message. The third launch, you're gonna shine. So it's, I want three launches before you ever throw in the towel and move to something else. The biggest mistake I see entrepreneurs across the board, um, aspiring entrepreneurs just getting started, they launch their first course, does okay, and then they're off to the next thing. Yeah, but this thing looks sexy, or I want to try that, yeah, or that guy's doing like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's the death of momentum. So my secret to success is always, I've done one thing, and then I just make it better and better and better. I love that. So 18 months is a reasonable expectation, but you're you're putting the work in every day to make yes. it Yes, yes. That's I think that's so important, because uh, what you just said with, with changing gears too quickly, I, I can't tell you how many how many times I see entrepreneurs get right up to the finish line and they don't even realize they're there and they give up because oh, it kills me. <laughs> Rachel tells me that all the time. She says that I have shiny object syndrome, which is 100% <laughs> like, 
true. We're going back here, back yeah, here. Always, always like, <laughs> Very common. You're not alone. I my love friend. your idea, but we're not going to do it. I say yeah. that. <laughs> Actually, Rachel, you two are a great mix. I have someone on my team as well that she's like, okay, we can do that. But that means we're not going to do X, Y, Z, and you're not going to make this money or that goal. And I'm like, okay, just joking. Just joking. Yeah. Stay on the course. Well, I, you know what? I have... I have too many, my, my team, my COO, like it was very exasperated with me because I'm always like, I, they were joke. My team was joking, kind of ripping on me yesterday. Cause we did like a personality analysis and mine came up that you can come up with a, like a new idea three times a week. And they're like, try three times an hour. So <laughs> what I've started doing and, and I, I see it, it can also frustrate people. Cause you yeah. know, you try to push people in different very. directions. Um, I started writing a list of like all the things that I want to do someday, like all my great ideas. And then like, I always reorganize them, but you only pick one to work on, you know, one to two at the most. So So smart. I think that is a brilliant thing to do. And I think all of us should be doing that because it's that one, it's that idea of essentialism or the one thing there's books Mm -hmm. written about this, both books, but it is one of the things that, um, I know for sure is that if you, if you don't do that, you have a bunch of open loops on in your business and nothing to reach completion. And as an entrepreneur, we need to feel what it feels like to, to complete that, yeah. that one and thing. It's so dangerous to fall into the reactive mindset because you set sail on like six different things you want to work on. And then you lose sight of the, the end goals for all of those things. So, I mean, I'm talking about it. Like I, I play a really good game. I fall off that wagon multiple times a day, but you know, if I remind myself and go through the steps, usually you can kind of recover, but that, that feedback on the 18 months is great. So I want everybody to really remember that and not give up too soon. Not yeah. give up too soon. That's so important. So let me ask you, let me ask you this, and I'm, I'm backtracking a little bit here, but when it comes to people who are looking to create courses, is the best way to market? I mean, there's a series of steps, obviously, and it, it depends a little bit on pr- perhaps who your audience is and specifically what you're teaching. But is the first step to having a successful course, growing that email list with quality people, is that the mo- is that what you have found to be the most important? One million percent in attracting the right people. So let's say you don't know exactly what your course is going to be about just yet, but you have some kind of idea. That's when you want to create a lead magnet, some kind of guide, freebie checklist that would attract the kind of audience that would eventually maybe want to buy your digital course. So for example, if you have a digital course teaching people how to shine and succeed on video, then you're not going to have a freebie all about how to budget your checkbook as an entrepreneur. Those those two just don't really go together. So um, they could, but it's a little bit of a stretch. So instead you want to have like the three pieces of equipment that are sure to get you up and running quickly. And that's your freebie. Now they're feeling like this is a little bit doable. What else you got? Oh, well down the road, you've got a course to sell them. Right. So speaking of courses, you have a launch that's going on right now. And as I mentioned, you are the course master. Uh, Tell us about your courses, where people can, where people can get them. Well, thanks so much for asking. So I have a a course called Digital Course Academy. It's so meta. I have a course that teaches you how to create courses, but in Digital (laughs) Course Academy, by the way, what's that? It's very good. Oh, thank you so much. So the Digital Course Academy teaches you how to create a digital course from scratch. If you've never done this before, how to create a digital course from scratch, really coming up with the idea and then going through the steps to do so and then launching it. So I teach you about webinars and email marketing and social media and how to find this audience so that you have people to sell to when you're ready to sell. And it's my favorite course because it helps people create online businesses. Like you could literally... Uh, I believe you could make a million dollars with one digital course. Now I'm not saying one launch. I just mean, if you stick with something long enough, it could be incredibly profitable. So you don't need tons of courses to be successful. So yeah, Digital Course Academy, my favorite, my favorite course. And um, you can find more about it on my website, amyporterfield.com. You're launching that now. And then if there's other information people want to learn about your podcast, learn more about you, learn about your other course, where can they go to find out all of that good stuff? Yes. So my podcast is called Online Marketing Made Easy. 
and it's wherever you listen to podcasts and then anything else that we're doing, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll hear about it. So I'm uh, at Amy Porterfield. That's my Instagram handle. And we can also get a glimpse of your husband on there. Yes. If you want to see that sexy beard that he grew now that we're living in Tennessee and he's, he's a mountain man. (laughs) Is he wearing overalls? No, but he might be. Watch out. It might happen. (laughs) And we might get you trying the TikTok wall thing, right? Maybe. I'm waiting for Carrie to do it first. Okay. I'll do it. I'll tag you. We can start a challenge. (laughs) Ooh. My husband against yours. Although my husband husband is asleep right now. He did, he he flew in. He's a pilot. He he flew overnight from Brazil. So I'll give him I'll give him a little bit of. A I'm pass. glad you mentioned that because you made him sound very lazy. I know. I know. <laughs> no, there, that, that was the initial goal, and then I had to. Do the and call. then you feel kind of bad about it. I get it. You know what's so funny? I was on the phone with. I'm writing a book right now, and I I'm, I was on the phone with one of my um a woman on my team that's helping me write the book, and it was like 5 a.m. and we were voice texting and we were both whispering, and I said I'm whispering because Hobie and my dog are still sleeping. And she's like, I'm whispering because my husband and kid are still sleeping. And then I said, women rule the world. <sighs> Come on. Here we are making things happen. They're sleeping. I, we rule the world. We rule the world. You're <laughs> absolutely right. I just, I wish the world would recognize. <laughs> one, day, one day I'm on a mission. They're, they're, we're getting there. It's, it's just around the corner. I'm sure of it. So I want to ask you one other question. You talked about the freebies that you offer. Can people find them on your website? Yes. And uh, the, my most popular freebie is a quiz on how to know if you are ready for a digital course. And it's just amyporterfield.com forward slash quiz. So uh, it's a really fun quiz and it gives you your marching orders in the next step. So that's where you would find my most popular freebie that I have. What else would you like to add? Is there anything that we didn't ask you that you wanted to touch upon? Anything you didn't get a chance to discuss or elaborate on? You know, nothing that you didn't ask. And this has been so much fun. You girls are so fun to talk to. But I guess I would just like end with saying that the reason I am so passionate about helping people create digital courses is especially women is because I believe that when you become your own boss, the world opens up for you and other women. So I have a team of 20 full-time employees all across the US and 18 of them are women and four of them are in leadership roles where they make great money and big bonuses. And I think that because I'm my own boss and I wanna empower other women, I am contributing to that. So I believe we bust through glass ceilings. I believe we do bigger and better things when we get to make the decisions and call the shots. So I'm just on a mission help more women become their own bosses. And I believe digital courses will help do so. So I just wanted to throw that in because that's what, what what really gets me up in the morning. That's what you're all about. I actually find that we have a hard time with diversity with men. We only have two men on our team too. I I know it's like, I might need to look into that a little bit. It's a reverse (laughs) diversity issue. I know it's so true. So uh, one final question, give us all a fun fact about you, something we may not know. So fun fact about me, I would say that I am obsessed with true crime to the point that it's a sickness and (laughs) you can find me watching a murder mystery at any time of day. If you, if I have earbuds in, I'm likely listening to my favorite podcast, which is called crime junkies. And so it's just a sickness, I think, but I love it. It's my favorite way to, to, to kind of step away from the business stuff. Sometimes decompress. Yeah. Listening to like gory murder. Was so it safe to say your next career might be a, in a detective role? Okay. Or I would, I would love it if I started my own crime pond podcast. I do not have enough time. I can't do it. My <laughs> husband will be so mad at me to take on a new project, but that would be my, my ultimate. I'd love it. You, you know need I mean? to figure out how to tie a course into that, man. Right? Yes. I know. I'll have Whether to think about that one. All right. Well, if you need any ideas, we're always here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You are amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love talking to you ladies. I think this podcast is such a great idea. So thanks so much for including me. Absolutely. It was our pleasure. And with that, we will wrap up. We'll thank our audience for joining us for this episode of the Mavens of Marketing, and we will see you next week. It's a teaser. 
coming up next week on the Mavens of Marketing, we are joined by one of my favorite people in the world, Vicki Hart. Not only is she a master at marketing, she's a damn funny lady too. So she's going to share all of her sneak peeks and tricks. And by the way, she and Rachel work together. So there's a little back and forth there too. See you next week.